Happy Friday, my gritty sixth graders, and thanks to those of you who came in on the Zoom. We will be doing Zoom on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 o'clock, so make sure you get connected with us. Um, it won't be the same uh, information, so I'm just going to schedule that as a recurring meeting, and we can go from there. All right, so... I covered a lot of math and stuff earlier with the people who asked me on Zoom. I'm gonna let it go for this weekend, and if you have more questions, by all means, get those questions, get them ready for Tuesday morning at 10. We can go through the packet, we can go through other questions on other assignments, we'll go from there. Um, but it's Friday, so I thought, you know what? Besides reading this, let's go ahead and read another one of Hercules' labors. Because, you know, it's all that demigod life. Now, I know we read how this all started. We read about the lion. We read about the hind. I think we read about the boar and the hydra. I think we are at the Stymphalian birds. Um... Assignment, get rid of them. Nasty. These birds be had beaks and wings of iron. You would never, ever want to mess with a Stymphalian bird. Not if you knew it was good for you. The birds lived around Lake Stym Stymphalos. Stymphalos. It's really hard to read Greek. Uh, they were a menace and no one knew what to do. Enter Heracles. Now these scary metal birds flocked together. Think of the noise when they bumped up against each other. Clang, clang, clang. Well, this gave Heracles a bright idea. He got a hold of some big metal cymbals and banged them together. Crash! The sound was so awful, it scared the Stymphalian birds. Even Stymphalian birds uh, can get scared, you know. Frightening as they themselves are. And off they flew in all directions, scattering. This meant that Heracles could now go after them one by one, a much easier proposition. He put out his bow and arrow and kerboing, one less Stymphalian bird. He kept at it until the few birds left alive decided to split from the lake. Goodbye, Stymphalian birds. Wherever you are, I hope you stay there. So we'll keep reading a little bit of this, I don't know, every day, every other day or something like that. But we'll go from there. Now, this is a AR book. I think it's an AR book. We'll check and we'll go from there. Uh, Matthew had a good idea. He said, hey, Mr. Trimmer, is there any way that you can like take the quiz and like put it onto paper or something like that if we tell you what books we've read? And then you could take it and then the answers are there. So when we get back to school, you can ch -ch 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 -ch. You can do it while the book is still fresh in your head. So send me lists. Hey, Miss Rimmer, I read this book. I read this book. I read this book. If it's an AR book, I'll look it up and we'll see what we can do. Um, because I don't think it's fair, especially when some of you are really, really, really trying to still meet your goals, to just say, oh, no goals. It's like, oh, school's not out. School's not in, so we don't do goals anymore. We're still doing goals. We're just changing them a little. So, all right, let's pick up where we left off on I play dodgeball with cannibals. All right, so Percy and Tyson, it's the last day of school at Meriwether Prep and it's kind of a weird school to begin with and they've been pushed into the gym. Um, and Percy hears this odd, Percy, but can't find anyone. Who do you think that could be? Hmm. The gym uniform at Meriwether is sky blue shorts and tie-dye t-shirts. Fortunately, we did most of our athletic stuff inside, so we didn't have to jog through Tribeca looking like a bunch of boot camp hippie children. I changed as quickly as I could in the locker room because I didn't want to deal with Sloan. I was about to leave when Tyson called Percy. He hadn't changed yet. He was standing by the weight room door clutching his gym clothes. Will you, um, oh yeah, I tried not to sound aggravated about it. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Tyson ducked inside the weight room. I stood guard outside the door while he changed. I felt kind of awkward doing this, but he asked me to most days. I think it's because he's completely hairy and he's got weird scars on his back that I've never had the courage to ask. Anyway, I learned the hard way that if people teased Tyson while he was dressing out, he'd get upset and start ripping the doors off of lockers. 
When we got into the gym, Coach Nunley was sitting at his little desk reading Sports Illustrated. Nunley was about a million years old with bifocals and no teeth and a greasy wave of gray hair. He reminded me of the oracle at Camp Half-Blood, which was a shriveled up mummy, except Coach Nunley moved a lot less and never billowed green smoke. Well, at least not that I had noticed. Matt Sloan said, Coach, can I be captain? Eh? Coach Nunley looked up from his magazine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sloan grinned and took charge of picking. He made me the other team's captain, but it didn't matter who I picked because all the jocks and the popular kids moved on to Sloan's sides. So did the big group of visitors. On my side, I had Tyson, Corey Baylor, the computer geek, Raj Mandali, the calculus whiz, and a half a dozen other kids who always got harassed by Sloan and his gang. Normally, I would have been okay with just Tyson. He was worth half a team by himself. But the visitors on Sloan's team were almost as tall and strong looking as Tyson, and there were six of them. Matt Sloan spilled a cage full of balls in the middle of the gym. Scared, Tyson mumbled. Smell funny. I looked at him. What smells funny? Because I didn't figure he was talking about himself. Them. Tyson pointed at Sloan's new friends. Smell funny. The visitors were cracking their knuckles, eyeing us like it was slaughter time. I couldn't help wondering where they were from. Some place where they fed kids raw meat and beat them with sticks. Sloan blew the coach's whistle and the game began. Sloan's team ran for the center line. On my side, Raj Bandali was yelling something in Urdu, probably, I have to go putty, and ran for the exit. Corey Baylor tried to crawl behind the wall math and hide. The rest of my team did their best to cower in fear and not look like targets. Tyson, I said, let's go. A ball slammed into my gut. I sat down hard in the middle of the gym floor. The other team exploded in laughter. My eyesight was fuzzy. I felt like I had just gotten the Heimlich maneuver from a gorilla. I couldn't believe anyone could throw that hard. Tyson yelled, Percy, duck! I rolled it as another dodgeball whistled past my ear at the speed of sound. Woom! It hit the wall mat and Corey Baylor yelped. Hey, I yelled at Sloan's team, you could kill somebody. A visitor named Joe Bob grinned at me evilly. Somehow he looked a lot bigger now, even taller than Tyson. His biceps bulged beneath his t-shirt. I hope so, Perseus Jackson, I hope so. The way he said my name sent a chill down my back. Nobody called me Perseus except those who knew my true identity, friends, enemies. What did Tyson say? They smelled funny? Monsters. All around Matt Sloan, the visitors were growing in size. They were no longer kids. They were eight foot tall giants with wild eyes, pointy teeth, and hairy arms tattooed with snakes and hula women and valentine hearts. Matt Sloan dropped his ball. Whoa, you're not from Detroit, who? The other kids on his team started screaming and backing towards the exit, but the giant named Marrow Sucker threw a ball with deadly accuracy. It streaked past Raj Madali as he was about to leave and hit the door, slamming it shut like magic. Raj and some of the other kids banged on it desperately, but it wouldn't budge. Let them go, I yelled at the giants. The one called Joe Bob growled at me. He had a tattoo on his bicep that said, JB loves baby cakes. And lose our tasty morsels. No, son of the sea god, we last Dragonians aren't just playing for your death. We want lunch. He waved his hand and a new batch of dodgeballs appeared on the center line. But these balls weren't made of red rubber. They were bronze, the size of cannonballs, perforated like wiffle balls with fire bubbling out of the holes. They must have been searing hot, but the giants picked them up with their bare hands. Coach, I yelled. Nunley looked up sleepily, but if he saw anything abnormal about the dodgeball game, he didn't let on. That's the problem with mortals. The magical force called the mist obscures the true appearances of monsters and gods from their vision, so mortals tend to only see what they can understand. Maybe the coach saw a few eighth graders pounding the younger kids like usual. Maybe the other kids saw Matt Sloan's thugs getting ready to toss Molotov cocktails around. It wouldn't be the first time. At any rate, I was pretty sure nobody else realized they were dealing with genuine man-eating, bloodthirsty giants. Monsters. Yeah, mm-hmm. Coach muttered, play nice. He went back to his magazine. The giant named Skull Eater threw his ball. I dove aside as the fiery bronze comet sailed past my shoulder. Corey, I screamed. Tyson pulled him out from behind the exercise mat just as the ball exploded against it, blasting the mat to smoking shreds. 
run, I told my teammates, to the other exit. They ran for the locker rooms, but with another wave of Joe Bob's hand, that door also slammed shut. No one leaves unless you're out, Joe Bob roared, and you're not out until we eat you. He launched his own fireball. My teammates scattered as it blasted a crater in the gym floor. I reached for Riptide, which I always kept in my pockets, but then I realized I was wearing gym shorts. I had no pockets. Riptide was tucked inside my jeans inside my gym locker, and the locker room door was sealed. I was completely defenseless. Another fireball came streaking towards me. Tyson pushed me out of the way, but the explosion still blew me, blew me head over heels. I found myself sprawled on the gym floor, dazed from smoke, my tie-dye shirt peppered with sizzling holes. Just across the center line, two hungry giants were glaring down at me. Flesh, they bellowed. Hero flesh for lunch, they both took aim. Percy needs help, Tyson yelled, and he jumped in front of me just as they threw their balls. Tyson, I screamed, but it was too late. Both balls slammed into him, but no, he caught them. Sam had Tyson, who looked so clumsy, he knocked over lab equipment and broke playground structures on a regular basis um, and had caught two fiery metal balls speeding towards him at a zillion miles an hour. And he screamed, bad, as the bronze spheres exploded against their chest. The giants disintegrated in twin columns of flame. A sure sign they were monsters, all right. Monsters don't die, they just dissipate into smoke and dust, which saves heroes a lot of trouble cleaning up after a fight. My brothers, Joe Bob the cannibal wailed. He flexed his muscles and his baby cake tattoo rippled. You will pay for their destruction. Tyson, I said, look out. Another comet hurtled towards us. Tyson had just time to swat it aside. It flew over Coach Nunley's head and landed in the bleachers with a big kaboom. Kids were running around screaming, trying to avoid the sizzling craters in the floor. Others were banging on the door, calling for help. Sloan himself stood petrified in the middle of the court, watching in disbelief as balls of death flew around him. Coach Nunley still wasn't seeing anything. He tapped his hearing aid like the explosions were giving him interference, but he kept his eyes on his magazine. Surely the whole school would hear the noise. The headmaster, the police, somebody would come help us. Victory will be ours, roared Joe Bob the cannibal. We will feast on your bones. I wanted to tell him he was taking the dodgeball game a little too seriously, but before I could, he hefted another ball, and three other giants followed his lead. I knew we were dead. Tyson couldn't deflect all those balls at once. His hands had to be seriously burned from blocking the first volley. Without my sword, I had a crazy idea. I ran towards the locker room. Move, I told my teammates, away from the door. Explosions behind me. Tyson had batted two of the balls back towards their owners and blasted them into ashes. That left two giants still standing. The third ball hurtled towards straight at me. I forced myself to wait. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, then dove aside as the fiery sphere demolished the locker room door. Now I figured that the built-in gas in most boys' locker rooms was enough to cause an explosion, so I wasn't surprised when the flaming dodgeball ignited a huge whoop. The wall blew apart. Lockers, doors, socks, athletic supporters, and other various nasty personal belongings rained all over the gym. I turned in time just to see Tyson punch Skull Eater in the face. The giant crumbled. But the last giant, Joe Bob, had wisely held onto his own ball, waiting for an opportunity. He threw just as Tyson was turning to face him. No! I yelled. The ball caught Tyson square in the chest. He slid the length of the court and slammed into the back wall, which cracked and partially crumbled on top of him, making a hole right onto Church Street. I didn't see how Tyson could still be alive, but he only looked dazed. The bronze ball was smoking at his feet. Tyson tried to pick it up, but he fell back, stunned into a pile of cinder blocks. Well, Joe Bob gloated, I'm the last one standing. I'll have enough meat to bring baby cakes at doggy bag. He picked up another ball and aimed at Tyson. Stop, I yelled. It's me you want. The giant grinned. You wish to die first, young hero. I had to do something. Riptide had to be around here somewhere. Then I spotted my jeans in a smoking heap of clothes right by the giant's feet. If I could only get there, I knew it was hopeless, but I charged. The giant laughed. My lunch approaches. He raised his arm to throw. I braced myself to die. Suddenly the giant's body went rigid. His expression changed from gloating to surprise. 
right where his belly button should have been, his t-shirt ripped open and he grew something like a horn. No, not a horn, the glowing tip of a blade. The ball dropped out of his hand. The monster stared down at the knife that had just run through him from behind. He muttered, Ow! And then burst into a cloud of green flame, which I figured was going to make pretty baby cakes pretty upset. Standing in the smoke was my friend Annabeth. Her face was grimy and scratched. She had a ragged backpack slung over her shoulder, her, back, her baseball cap tucked into her pocket, a bronze knife at her hand and a wild look in her storm gray eyes like she'd just been chased a thousand miles by ghosts. Matt Sloan, who had been standing there dumbfounded the whole time, finally came to his senses. He blinked at Annabeth as if he dimly recognized her from his notebook, my notebook picture. That's the girl. That's the girl. Annabeth punched him in the nose and knocked him out. And you, she told him, lay off my friend. The gym was in flames. Kids were still running around screaming. I heard sirens wailing and garbled voice over the intercom. Through the glass windows of the exit door, I could see the headmaster, Mr. Bonsai, wrestling with the lock, a crowd of teachers piling up behind him. Annabeth, I stammered, how did you, how long have you, <sighs> pretty much all morning. She sheathed her brawn knife. I've been trying to find you, find a good time to talk to you, but you were never alone. The shadow I saw this morning, that was, my face wrote red hot. Oh my God, you were looking in my bedroom window. There is no time to explain, she snapped, though she looked a little red faced herself. I just didn't want to, there, a woman screamed. The door burst open and the adults came pouring in. Meet me outside, Annabeth told me, and him. She pointed to Tyson, who was still sitting dazed against the wall. Annabeth gave him a look of distaste. I didn't quite understand. You better bring him. What? No time. Hurry. She put her Yankees baseball cap on, which is a magic gift from her mom, and instantly vanished. That left me standing alone of the middle of burning gymnasium when the headmaster came charging in with half the faculty and a couple of police officers. Percy Jackson? Mr. Bonsai said, what? How? Over the broken wall, Tyson groaned and stood up from the pile of cinder blocks. Head hurts. Matt Sloan was coming around too. He focused on me with a look of terror. Percy did it, Mr. Bonsai. He set the whole building on fire. Coach Nunley will tell you he saw it all. Coach Nunley had been dutifully reading his magazine, but just my luck chose that moment to look up when Sloan said his name. Eh? Yeah? Mmm. The other adults turned towards me. I knew they would never believe me, even if I could tell them the truth. I grabbed Riptide out of my ruined jeans, told Tyson, come on, and jumped through the gaping hole in the side of the building. And that is where we're at for today. So, hope you've been enjoying the story. We will pick it up on Monday. Have a great and gritty weekend. Uh, thank you to Matthew, Emilio, Jacqueline, Evelyn, and Victoria for tuning in this morning to Zoom. I would love for the rest of you guys to do the same. So, come on, wake up, 10 o'clock Tuesday. I will send reminders on Dojo and Google Classroom. So, until then, Stay gritty. You are loved. You are respected. Peace out.